Isis, the virgin of the world. IT is especially fitting that a study of hermetic symbolism should begin with a discussion of the symbols and attributes of the Sadic Isis. This is the Isis of Say, famous for the inscription concerning her which appeared on the front of her temple in that city. I, Isis, am all that has been, that is or shall be, no mortal man hath ever me unveiled. Plutarch affirms that many ancient authors believed this goddess to be the daughter of Hermes. Others held the opinion that she was the child of Prometheus. Both of these demigods were noted for their divine wisdom. It is not improbable that her kinship to them is merely allegorical. Plutarch translates the name Isis to mean wisdom. Godfrey Higgins, in his Anacalypsis, derives the name of Isis from the Hebrew, Iso, and the Greek zoo, to save. Some authorities, however, for example, Richard Payne Knight, as stated in his Symbolical Language of Ancient Art and Mythology, believe the word to be of Northern extraction, possibly Scandinavian or Gothic. In these languages the name is pronounced Isa, meaning ice or water in its most passive, crystallized, negative state. This Egyptian deity under many names appears as the principle of natural fecundity among nearly all the religions of the ancient world. She was known as the goddess with 10,000 appellations and was metamorphosed by Christianity into the Virgin Mary. For Isis, although she gave birth to all living things chief among them the sun, still remained a virgin, according to the legendary accounts. Apuleius in the 11th book of the Golden Ass ascribes to the goddess the following statement concerning her powers and attributes, Behold, I moved by thy prayers, am present with thee, I who am nature, the parent of things, the queen of all the elements, the primordial progeny of ages, the supreme of divinities, the sovereign of the spirits of the dead, the first of the celestials, and the uniform resemblance of gods and goddesses. I, who rule by my nod the luminous summits of the heavens, the salubrious breezes of the sea, and the deplorable silences of the realms beneath, and whose one divinity the whole orb of the earth venerates under a manifold form, by different rites and a variety of appellations. Hence the primogenial Phrygians call me Pessinantica, the mother of the gods, the Attic Aborigines, Scropian Minerva, the floating Cyprians, Paphian Venus. The arrow-bearing Cretans, Diana Dictina, the three-tongued Sicilians, Stygian Proserpine, and the Eleusinians, the ancient goddess Ceres. Some also call me Juno, others Bologna, others Hecate, and others Ramnesia. And those who are illuminated by the incipient rays of that divinity the sun, when he rises, viz. The Ethiopians, the Ari, and the Egyptians skilled in ancient learning, worshipping me by ceremonies perfectly appropriate, call me by my true name, Queen Isis. Laplongeon believes that the Egyptian myth of Isis had a historical basis among the Mayas of Central America, where this goddess was known as Queen Mu. In Prince Co the same author finds a correspondence to Osiris, the brother-husband of Isis. Laplongeon's theory is that Mayan civilization was far more ancient than that of Egypt. After the death of Prince Ko, his widow, Queen Mu, fleeing to escape the wrath of his murderers, sought refuge among the Mayan colonies in Egypt, where she was accepted as their queen and was given the name of Isis. While Laplongeon may be right, the possible historical queen sinks into insignificance when compared with the allegorical, symbolic world virgin. 
And the fact that she appears among so many different races and peoples discredits the theory that she was a historical individual. According to Sextus Empiricus, the Trojan War was fought over a statue of the Moon Goddess. For this lunar Helena, and not for a woman, the Greeks and Trojans struggled at the gates of Troy. Several authors have attempted to prove that Isis, Osiris, Typhon, Nephthys, and Aruerus Thoth, or Mercury, were grandchildren of the great Jewish patriarch Noah by his son Ham. But as the story of Noah and his Ark is a cosmic allegory concerning the repopulation of planets at the beginning of each world period, this only makes it less likely that they were historical personages. According to Robert Flood, the sun has three properties life, light, and heat. These three vivify and vitalize the three worlds spiritual, intellectual, and material. Therefore, it is said, from one light, three lights, i.e., the first three master masons. In all probability, Osiris represents the third, or material, aspect of solar activity, which by its beneficent influences vitalizes and enlivens the flora and fauna of the Earth. Osiris is not the sun, but the sun is symbolic of the vital principle of nature, which the ancients knew as Osiris. His symbol, therefore, was an opened eye, in honor of the great eye of the universe, the sun. Opposed to the active, radiant principle of impregnating fire, here, and motion was the passive, receptive principle of nature. Modern science has proved that forms ranging in magnitude from solar systems to atoms are composed of positive, radiant nuclei surrounded by negative bodies that exist upon the emanations of the central life. From this allegory we have the story of Solomon and his wives, for Solomon is the sun and his wives and concubines are the planets, moons, asteroids, and other receptive bodies within his house the solar mansion. Isis, represented in the Song of Solomon by the Dark Maid of Jerusalem, is symbolic of receptive nature the watery, maternal principle which creates all things out of herself after impregnation has been achieved by the virility of the sun. In the ancient world the year had 360 days. The five extra days were gathered together by the god of cosmic intelligence to serve as the birthdays of the five gods and goddesses who are called the sons and daughters of Ham. Upon the first of these special days Osiris was born and upon the fourth of them Isis. The number four shows the relation that this goddess bears to the earth and its elements. Typhon the Egyptian demon or spirit of the adversary, was born upon the third day. Typhon is often symbolized by a crocodile, sometimes his body is a combination of crocodile and hog. Isis, stands for knowledge and wisdom, and according to Plutarch the word Typhon means insolence and pride. Egotism, self-centeredness, and pride are the deadly enemies of understanding and truth. This part of the allegory is revealed. After Osiris, here symbolized as the sun, had become king of Egypt and had given to his people the full advantage of his intellectual light, he continued his path through the heavens, visiting the peoples of other nations and converting all with whom he came in contact. Plutarch further asserts that the Greeks recognized in Osiris the same person whom they revered under the names of Dionysus and Bacchus. While he was away from his country, his brother, Typhon, the evil one, like the Loki of Scandinavia, plotted against the sun god, to destroy him, gathering 72 persons as fellow conspirators, he attained his nefarious end in a most subtle manner. 
He had a wonderful ornamented box made just the size of the body of Osiris. This he brought into a banquet hall where the gods and goddesses were feasting together. All admired the beautiful chest, and Typhon promised to give it to the one whose body fitted it most perfectly. One after another lay down in the box, but in disappointment rose again, until at last Osiris also tried. The moment he was in the chest Typhon and his accomplices nailed the cover down and sealed the cracks with molten lead. They then cast the box into the Nile, down which it floated to the sea. Plutarch states that the date upon which this occurred was the 17th day of the month Athir, when the sun was in the constellation of Scorpio. This is most significant, for the scorpion is the symbol of treachery. The time when Osiris entered the chest was also the same season that Noah entered the ark to escape from the deluge. Plutarch further declares that the pans and satyrs, the nature spirits and elementals, first discovered that Osiris had been murdered. These immediately raised an alarm, and from this incident the word panic, meaning fright or amazement of the multitudes, originated. Isis, upon receiving the news of her husband's murder, which she learned from some children who had seen the murderers making off with the box, at once robed herself in mourning and started forth in quest of him. At length Isis discovered that the chest had floated to the coast of Byblos. There it had lodged in the branches of a tree, which in a short time miraculously grew up around the box. This so amazed the king of that country that he ordered the tree to be cut down and a pillar made from its trunk to support the roof of his palace. Isis, visiting Byblos, recovered the body of her husband, but it was again stolen by Typhon, who cut it into fourteen parts, which he scattered all over the earth. Isis, in despair, began gathering up the severed remains of her husband, but found only thirteen pieces. The fourteenth part, the phallus, she reproduced in gold, for the original had fallen into the river Nile and had been swallowed by a fish. Typhon was later slain in battle by the son of Osiris. Some of the Egyptians believed that the souls of the gods were taken to heaven, where they shone forth as stars. It was supposed that the soul of Isis gleamed from the dog star, while Typhon became the constellation of the bear. It is doubtful, however, whether this idea was ever generally accepted. Among the Egyptians, Isis is often represented with a headdress consisting of the empty throne chair of her murdered husband, and this peculiar structure was accepted during certain dynasties as her hieroglyphic. The headdresses of the Egyptians have great symbolic and emblematic importance for they represent the auric bodies of the superhuman intelligences, and are used in the same way that the nimbus, halo, and aureole are used in Christian religious art. Frank C. Higgins, a well-known Masonic symbolist, has astutely noted that the ornate headgears of certain gods and pharaohs are inclined backward at the same angle as the Earth's axis. The robes, insignia, jewels, and ornamentations of the ancient hierophants symbolize the spiritual energies radiating from the human body. Modern science is rediscovering many of the lost secrets of hermetic philosophy. One of these is the ability to gauge the mental development, the soul qualities, and the physical health of an individual from the streamers of semi-visible electric force which pour through the surface of the skin of every human being at all times during his life. For details concerning a scientific process for making the auric emanations visible, see The Human Atmosphere by Dr. Walter J. Kilner. Isis is sometimes symbolized by the head of a cow, 
Occasionally the entire animal is her symbol. The first gods of the Scandinavians were licked out of blocks of ice by the mother cow, Adumla, who symbolized the principle of natural nutriment and fecundity because of her milk. Occasionally Isis is represented as a bird. She often carries in one hand the crux ansata, the symbol of eternal life, and in the other the flowered scepter, symbolic of her authority. Thoth Hermes Trismegistus, the founder of Egyptian learning, the wise man of the ancient world, gave to the priests and philosophers of antiquity the secrets which have been preserved to this day in myth and legend. These allegories and emblematic figures conceal the secret formulae for spiritual, mental, moral, and physical regeneration commonly known as the mystic chemistry of the soul, alchemy. These sublime truths were communicated to the initiates of the mystery schools, but were concealed from the profane. The latter, unable to understand the abstract philosophical tenets, worshipped the concrete sculptured idols which were emblematic of these secret truths. The wisdom and secrecy of Egypt are epitomized in the Sphinx, which has preserved its secret from the seekers of a hundred generations. The mysteries of Hermeticism, the great spiritual truths hidden from the world by the ignorance of the world, and the keys of the secret doctrines of the ancient philosophers, are all symbolized by the Virgin Isis. Veiled from head to foot, she reveals her wisdom only to the tried and initiated few who have earned the right to enter her sacred presence, tear from the veiled figure of nature its shroud of obscurity, and stand face to face with the divine reality. The explanations in these pages of the symbols peculiar to the Virgin Isis are based, unless otherwise noted, on selections from a free translation of the fourth book of Bibliothèque des Philosophes Hermetiques, entitled, The Hermetical Signification of the Symbols and Attributes of Isis, with interpolations by the compiler to amplify and clarify the text. The statues of Isis were decorated with the sun, moon, and stars, and many emblems pertaining to the earth, over which Isis was believed to rule, as the guardian spirit of nature personified. Several images of the goddess have been found upon which the marks of her dignity and position were still intact. According to the ancient philosophers, she personified universal nature, the mother of all productions. The deity was generally represented as a partly nude woman, of ten pregnant, sometimes loosely covered with a garment either of green or black color, or of four different shades intermingled black, white, yellow, and red. Apuleius describes her as follows. In the first place, then her most copious and long hairs being gradually intorted and promiscuously scattered on her divine neck were softly defluous. A multiform crown, consisting of various flowers bound the sublime summit of her head. And in the middle of the crown just on her forehead, there was a smooth orb resembling a mirror or rather a white refulgent light, which indicated that she was the moon. Vipers rising up after the manner of furrows, environed the crown on the right hand and on the left and cerulean ears of corn were also extended from above. Her garment was of many colors and woven from the finest flax and was at one time lucid with a white splendor at another yellow from the flower of crocus and at another flaming with a rosy redness. But that which most excessively dazzled my sight was a very black robe, fulgid with a dark splendor, and which spreading round and passing under her right side and ascending to her left shoulder, there rose protuberant like the center of a shield the dependent part of the robe falling in many folds and having small knots of fringe, gracefully flowing in its extremities. 
Glittering stars were dispersed through the embroidered border of the robe, and through the whole of its surface. And the full moon, shining in the middle of the stars, breathed forth flaming fires. Nevertheless, a crown, wholly consisting of flowers and fruits of every kind, adhered with indivisible connection to the border of that conspicuous robe, in all its undulating motions. What she carried in her hands also consisted of things of a very different nature. For her right hand, indeed, bore a brazen rattle, sistrum, through the narrow lamina, of which bent like a belt, certain rods passing, produced a sharp triple sound, through the vibrating motion of her arm. An oblong vessel, in the shape of a boat, depended from her left hand, on the handle of which in that part in which it was conspicuous, an asp raised its erect head and largely swelling neck. And shoes woven from the leaves of the victorious palm tree covered her immortal feet. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe, and I will see you again for more videos.